because it's my first time introducing anybody uh, in anything like a significant way, and because I'm new here, I made myself a little sick worrying about what I was going to say to introduce Terrence. But I now understand what I need to do, and thankfully I can keep it short. You all know, I hope, the bright parts of his professional biography. He's published five full-length books, had poems in the Best American Poetry Series, and everywhere else. Won a Whitey Writers Award, the Kate Tufts Discovery Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a fellowship from the National Endowment of the Arts, a Pushcart Prize, the National Book Award, and a MacArthur Genius Grant. So I don't need to mention any of that. I, I can't say anything new about Terrence's brilliance. What I can say is this. Terrence has always represented to me, personally, uh, what new thing can I say about a writer so central to contemporary poetry that isn't personal. Terence has always represented possibility. The poems of a good poet end in the reader. The poems of a great poet begin in the reader. Indeed, the poems of a great poet begin the reader. With each new poem, the reader is reborn, and in this way, each poem is loaded with possibility it cannot contain. And this extends to the essays of a great poet and the lectures of a great poet. And though I had experienced this before, I read Terence's poems, it was in Terence's poems that I first recognized it. And now I, personally, here with you, am excited to get to it. Please join me in welcoming you. <laughs> The prizes and stuff that you didn't mention—that was perfect. Um, uh, yeah, so you know what? I'm just going to read this because if I start not reading it, it'll I'll add five pages to it. I think of it as pretty short, and I think I got like some you know some sounds and stuff that I will certainly play if I get through it quickly, and possibly play if I get through it on time, and will not play if I go. Over. All right, so uh, you know, I'll just read. I'm trying to fold in how loopy and sort of the two things I'm juggling, the two uh, sort of, they're really separate essays that I'm trying to kind of think of uh, together here. So let me just read it to you. I'm sure there's stuff I'm going to have to correct. A poetics of politics, question mark. The question mark is the thing I'm most sure about in the title. My definition of poetics and politics, and probably all of my definitions, certainly of Negro, as you'll see, blackness, America. Uh, see, I'm going to ramble out, like, you know, feminism, nationalism, all these words, I think uh, I have to explain myself to people when I start thinking about my own definitions. Um, so we'll have to discuss that. So that's really what I'm going to say. I'm going to read through this thing, and when we talk, you can tell me if I need to refine some of these definitions, and I'll, I won't do it, but you can voice it. Um, so poetics, I'm not sure even Aristotle himself from 3030 BC or anyone since has really devised a solid definition of poetics. Uh, sometimes it's a noun, sometimes it's an adjective, Sometimes it's simply synonymous with aesthetics, and I, I do think just in general that's where I think of it. But in the classroom especially, I think of poetics as just strategies that reveal a poet's aesthetics, which is slightly different to me than just saying it's about aesthetics. It is about like the building of aesthetics, the sensibility, where one's aesthetics come from, I think. Um, so my questions about poetics are rooted in questions of poems, and my questions about politics, I think, are rooted in questions of power. So those are two, let me make sure, I, let me get a time to go on so I don't, uh, Lose track of y'all. The time will keep me on track. Let me see. Where's my time here? Stopwatch. Yeah, that seems like that'll work. Um, so those two things that I'm trying to bring together. Uh, so like in 1806, Fisher Ames, who's an anti-Jeffersonian Federalist, uh, said essentially what politics were. Politics is the science of good sense applied to public affairs. He likely was not thinking about the particular politics of race, gender, or class, but these certainly fall under the roof of public affairs. Race, especially as it relates to black and white Americans, fills a very big room in our very big house of public affairs, our being just, you know, Americans. Economic affairs, cultural affairs, moral affairs, and when I want to think about being American or black or mortal or being me, I go to poems. So I, that's, again, sort of the under, thing. it all really comes back. Even when I'm thinking about politics, I'm really still thinking about poems. Um, the poems I've been trying to write lately are mostly personal. Um, so even when they're political, I think of this notion of the personal. And partly what that is is what Frank O'Hara calls personism in that crazy manifesto he's got going, which I can't lay it out because he's not super clear in it, but he's like the poem is between the poet and the reader, and it's like a conversation happening. So this notion of the letter, 
uh, and the conversation and the intimacy in that is part of what I think about when I say, certainly the poems I've been writing, I've been trying to think about what the personal is. So it's that, it's partly personality, a poem holds all registers and uh, interests, a poem does hold politics, but it also holds ticks, history and histrionic, spirituality, confusion, eros, weirdos, your mama's hairdos. Um, a poem may include the capital I in identity, but the notion of identity alone lacks the intimacy of personality for me. So personality is the domain of individuals, and identity, I think, is the domain of groups, cultures, stances, theories, traditions, social sciences, all super important, but not vital, and often even peripheral to the true work of getting yourself outside of yourself, uh, of giving shape to what has shaped you, which again is, I think, a part of how I think of what poetics are for poets. Uh, and this feels like a good way to think about poetics, the shape of what shaped the poet, but does this work for politics? Uh, politics gives shape to one's values, beliefs, and identity, and certainly the current, air quotes, president, believes politics are about his values, his beliefs, and identity, so you can kind of see how that easy equation becomes problematic in the hands of someone who has not really thought about the science of good sense applied to public affairs. Um, so this is just some of the essay, and that's my lead-in, about my, really, my personal politics. I'll look at some poems, one or two, I think, and we can read them. I'll read them, uh, I think I got audio for them, actually. And this is just sort of leading to what I think would be our conversation, which is what does this really mean, this question mark, as opposed to me telling you what it means. I think a conversation behind that is, would be good. So, but here's one thing. Uh, so I have so many of these poems, you know, and I was like, I, I'm going to talk about Baldwin, and I just remember one of the American sonnets that did not get into it. So I thought I'd read it because it's like, it's going to be gone. I'll probably burn it once I send this book on it. Um, but um, it leads into this conversation about Baldwin, so I thought, this let me just read this other Baldwin poem that didn't make it in. Uh, and it's just literally what I'm going into is the subject of the poem. Uh, American sonnet for my past and future assassin. What does your average white James Baldwin fan, in line to see I am not your Negro, really know about Negroes? Or Baldwin, the boy preacher who lifted himself out of poverty with a silver tongue. His face was a feat of clairvoyant emotional motions. His chain smoking barely cloaked his cautions. His visage was the color and feel of, red, of wet driftwood. His big eyes often looked lost, absorbing, self-absorbed. His poise was sometimes mistaken for haughtiness. His shyness could be mistaken for meekness. Except the most elegant sentences swirled from the gap in his smile smelling of tobacco and brimstone. As existential as a blue note, as testimony, witness, blackness whistled through the lap, through the gap in Baldwin's teeth. So there's a scene in I'm Not Your Negro where Baldwin scoffs at Bobby Kennedy's prediction that a Negro could be president of the United States in about 40 years. I don't know if you remember this in the, in the documentary, which I think is now on like Amazon Prime. Uh, I saw it in the theater a couple of times. We now know that Kennedy was fairly accurate, uh, but in the film, Baldwin rolls those big boulder sized eyeballs of his when he says this idea. And then he later writes about it in that second essay of the fire next time, letter from a region of my mind. And this is his quote. White Americans find it as difficult as white people elsewhere do to invest, divest themselves of the notion that they are in possession of some intrinsic value that black people need or want. And this assumption, which for example makes the solution of the black problem depend on the speed with which Negroes accept and adopt white standards, is revealed in all kinds of striking ways, from Bobby Kennedy's assurance that a Negro can become president in 40 years, to the unfortunate tone of warm congratulations with which so many liberals address their Negro equals. Certainly when uh, Obama was in office, there was a warm tone of congratulations. So no other writer lets well-meaning white people have it like Baldwin. So they really don't know what to do with him. They know they're supposed to like him because smart black people know that they know like him. But he's so moody. He's moody all through that documentary. Even when he critiques Bobby Kennedy, you can see the devilish delight in him. He's almost teasing him. The mostly white audience I sat with chuckled at his scoffs both times I saw the film. I'm not sure they got why Baldwin was hurt because, you know, seemingly he was right. Uh, Kennedy was right. I'm not even sure they got all the implications of the movie's title. I'm not your Negro. I'm not whose Negro. I'm not white people's Negro. Uh, it's not the same as I'm not black people's Negro. And it's very likely white people have far fewer definitions of Negro than black people. Negro is not neutral for the black people I know. 
It can be used ironically, euphemistically, dismissively, always in judgment, as in he's the kind of Negro who loves to name drop James Baldwin. Notably, Baldwin never actually says, I am not your Negro, and I am not your Negro. Near the end of the film, he does say, I am not your nigger, which suggests what he might have titled the documentary, you know, if he had anything to do with it. So Negro wasn't always so slippery. Langston Hughes and uh, Negro Speaks of Rivers makes an appearance in almost every American literary anthology. It's one of our earliest encounters with him. Um, and one of his most well-known manifestos, for black people anyway, which is a whole other conversation because it should be for more people, is the Negro Artist in the Racial Mountain. The poem and essay appear in 1926, and the nation has solicited Hughes to write an essay in response to the Negro art hokum, an essay by Negro journalist George Shiler, uh, had published a week earlier in the magazine. Why should Negro artists of America vary from the national artistic norm, Shiloh wrote, insisting that what others call cultural distinctions were simply Negro stereotypes. Hughes argued no great poet has ever been afraid of being himself, and that this is the mountain standing in the way of any true Negro art in America. So that little part about him sort of responding to George Schuyler, I think I'm saying his name right, Schuyler, George Schuyler, is not always uh, remembered. But the essay itself certainly has lived on and it's become an important document for people thinking about you know, how to write about race, for black people thinking about it, and should be for all people. Uh, where the Negro speaking of rivers speaks, where the Negro speaking of rivers might safely be viewed as the dignified Negro of the Booker T. Washington mold, the Negro before the racial mountain is someone more complex and self-reflective. So here, I think, in that essay, Negro is synonymous with the blackness in the DNA later of the black arts movement, you know, a couple of decades later. It's also in the DNA of Baldwin's letter from a region of my mind, the one I talked about earlier. Or rather, Baldwin's essay understands I am Negro and am beautiful so deeply, which is a line from uh, Hughes' essay. He understands this notion, I am Negro and beautiful, so deeply that it does not need to be a manifesto or an argument. Schuyler asks, why should Negro artists of America vary from the national artistic norm? And Baldwin, or at least as I said, my Baldwin, my definition of Baldwin, would answer the Negro artists of America are the national artistic norm. So he meditates on blackness as a natural and deeply American way of being. And a course scene in that essay is where he visits the home of Elijah Muhammad, leader of the Nation of Islam at the time. Uh, now it may appear Baldwin's audience during this essay, for this essay, are the readers of The New Yorker, where it appeared in like 62. But as the essay's title suggests, it is a letter for all who care to read it, which again is sort of how I think about my, my own poems. Uh, thus his discussion of the nation is couched largely in a broader, near associative meditation on religion for black people. So he talks about growing up in Harlem, uh, being a boy preacher. It's a great essay. I mean, ta book has made the first one, uh, the letter to his nephew, seem like the kind of benchmark of that, but it really isn't. I, I think it's this essay here. Although that other essay is fine, but there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in this Letters from a Region of My Mind. Even the title sort of suggests some of this lyricism, I think. So the nation is and maybe remains a curiosity for anyone, I think black or white, thinking about religion and race in this country. So Baldwin is thinking about, thinking about the nation at its height. This is about three years before the assassination of Malcolm X, which is to say the nation of Islam still has some credibility, a possibility, certainly for black people at this time. Elijah Muhammad had seen Baldwin on a television show with Brother Malcolm and wanted to meet him. So Baldwin loves the dignified ferocity of the brothers and sisters around Elijah Muhammad, and he shows a special fondness and respect for uh, Elijah, but that doesn't keep him from knocking down some of the black power tenets of the nation of Islam, number one being the two Nate station. Uh, two Nations Solution. Again, this is like 62, and again, this is uh, where the, you don't, we don't know where this movie is going to go. We don't know what's going to happen with Malcolm X. So he's really entertaining it, and he really takes it in a very serious way. I don't know how often it's been written so seriously about since then. Um, they call for separate black territories, properties, and separate black economy in America. And Baldwin breaks down the logistical uh, and logical problems of such aspirations as only he can do. And then he writes, power was the subject of the speeches I heard. We were offered as Nation of Islam doctrine, historical and divine proof that all white people are cursed and are devils and are about to be brought down. So Baldwin knows the struggle for power is not the same as the struggle for freedom or for justice. And his thinking leads him to one of those mind-blowing Baldwin questions. What will happen to all that beauty? When I sat at Elijah's table and watched the baby, the women, and the men, and we talked about God's or Allah's vengeance, I wondered, 
when that vengeance was achieved, what will happen to all that beauty then? So in some ways, this is an extension of Hughes's I am Negro and Beautiful, and in other ways, as that is an extension of Black is Beautiful uh, from the Black Arts Movement. So Hughes ends his essay with the call to action. Let the blare of Negro jazz bands and the bellowing of Bessie Smith singing the blues penetrate the closed ears of the colored near intellectuals until they listen and perhaps understand. We younger Negro artists who create now intend to express our individual dark skin selves without fear or shame. So again, you can hear, you know, if you say black instead of Negro, how that certainly is directly connected to the black arts movement sort of doctrine of uh, you know, self-beauty, self-preservation, uh, self-respect. The great irony is 40 years later, after having written this, uh, Hughes found much of the black arts movement artists influenced by his call for individual dark-skinned selves writing without fear or shame, a little too fearless and a little too shameless. When Amiri Baraka uh, recollected the aims of the black arts movement, he said, we wanted an art that would actually reflect black life its history, its legacy of resistance and struggle. And so his poem, Black Art, is a sort of revised, intensified, updated version of the Negro artist in the racial mountain. And it begins, y'all probably know this poem, poems are bullshit unless they are teeth or trees or lemons piled on a step, you know, fuck poems, they are useful, would they shoot come at you, love what you are, breathe like wrestlers or shudder strangely after pissing. And so it ends with, I think, a line that echoes the ending of the, uh, the Hughes essay. We want poems that kill, assassin poems, poems that shoot guns, poems that wrestle cops into alleys and take their weapons, that there be no love poems until love can exist freely and cleanly. So again, a different kind of updated call to action that seems reflective of the times. But Hughes made some noteworthy political refinements as he aged. In the 1920s and 30s, when, his 19, when he was in his 20s and 30s, he wrote a direct and often socio-political communist-tinged poetry. And then by the 40s, when he was middle-aged, he began to cloak some of his political ideas in prose. And you'll know this. Uh, Jesse B. Simple, one of his characters from the newspaper, was one of the ways he, he started doing that. But it sort of was too late, because in the 50s, Joseph McCarthy and the House on Un-American Activities called him forward to repudiate his former writings and his philosophy, which he did, and I say which he did, unfortunately, because I, I don't actually think this is a, a great story for Langston Hughes uh, sort of succumbing to that. So Arnold Rampersad opened the second volume of his Hughes' biography with something Hughes wrote in his notebooks about a decade after the trial. So now we're back into the 60s, and we're into this period where also Baldwin is showing up and thinking about uh, the nation. So this biography, the volume two, opens with this quote. Politics can be the graveyard of a poet. Uh, and this certainly sounds like a repudiation of Baraka and even Baldwin, this idea that if you're engaging in any way, you're going to be in the grave. But what's interesting is it's just a partial excerpt of the Hughes note. Like if you read the book, which nobody will do, right? It's a biography, a second biography on a poet. But if you were to read it, you would find that there's a much fuller comment. So what he says in his notebook is, concerning politics, nothing I have said is true. A poet is a human being. Each human being must live within his time with and for his people and within the boundaries of his country. Therefore, how can a poet keep out of politics? So the fact that, and Arnold Robert Sy is cool, I've met him before, but the fact that you would just only have that and not the second half, I would call, this is not written down, I was like, there's no word than negrofication or something of Langston Hughes, you know. So Langston Hughes is a Negro poet, but he's been handled in a way to make him seem like that by leaving some of the more edgy stuff out of it. I mean, if it was there, he probably wouldn't be in the anthologies that we see. So, so I, that's one part of like thinking about him. So back to the nation. The nation of Islam wanted a black nation because it felt, and it can still feel, like two nations. A nation of white power needs a nation of people with no power to power it. There is still plenty of evidence we live in at least two Americas with separate churches, customs, fashions, TV shows, hair salons, separate nations naturally require separate anthems. So the Star Spangled Banner is for white America and Lift Every Voice and Sing is for black people. I talked to white people before they didn't even know there was a black national anthem. Uh, so I have a confession. I am not really a fan of the black national anthem. Anytime I have to sing it, I feel something between indifference and an eye roll. You really never know when the occasion will arise. I had to sing it at my daughter's high school African American seniors achievement ceremony in the spring, and the kid who led us in the song had a wonderful voice, but it's not the sort of song you can really throw your heart into. Lift every voice and sing is very respectable, which if someone calls you respectable, that's kind of an insult. It's kind of like 
calling you a Negro. It's not that the poem written by James Weldon Johnson in 1889 and set to music is a problem. Uh, it's not about the poem written by James Weldon Johnson in 1889 and set to music by his brother in 1905. So here's some lines from it. Lift every voice and sing. Y'all know this one? We're going to sing it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm done saying it. I'm just joking. Uh, to earth and heaven ring, ring with harmonies of liberty. Freedom, I believe, in singing until you're free. This is me saying this. Like, I hear that line. I'm like, sure, yeah. Lift every voice and sing. I'm all with that. Sing a song full of faith that the dark past has taught us. I'm like, okay, I can get with that. Dark past is, i probably use another adjective, but I'm with that. Um, <laughs> sing a song full of hope that the present has brought us, right? I totally agree with that. And then facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march until victory is won. And so it's the till victory is one part, because I'm always like, well, what does victory look like? And you can already hear some of this looking back in the direction of uh, Baldwin's question. Technically, uh, let's say, what does it look like? Does it look like equality? Technically, that's not victory. Like, if we're saying until equality is one, that's cool. Victory is something else. Uh, at best, that's a draw, if it's equality. Uh, does it look like justice? Justice always has shades of vengeance in it. And will white people become poor or more enslaved and black people richer and more free? Is that what victory is? That might be just, but you know that doesn't sound very Christian or Muslim. It's also bad karma and it ain't common sense. Uh, you just be looking over your shoulder all the time, which I really, I mean, this I'm half joking, but it's true. It's just not like practical thinking. It's not the science of good sense. Like what happens if you have to like, you know, fuck somebody up and then live with them after that seems, which is sort of what has already happened to us. <laughs> We see the problems with that. So what happens to your soul if victory is won by vengeance? Uh, I think if someone offered a heartfelt rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing, I might be swayed. Like maybe Billie Holiday or Jennifer Hudson, Jennifer Holiday could sing it as a ballad. I think the song would be transformed, actually, if it was sung by a white man. Say like Willie Nelson, y'all know I like Willie Nelson. If it would be as miraculous as hearing a black man play the Star Spangled Banner one morning at Woodstock before thousands of white half-naked people. Uh, that wasn't even the first time Hendrix played it. There are several other recordings, which is to say he wasn't just playing it because it was a moment and it was, you know, patriotic. He was playing it to work out some things. And maybe it was that the nation was at war. And maybe he played it because American leaders, JFK, Malcolm X, MLK, Bobby Kennedy, had been assassinated. And maybe he played it because it's the song we should play when we are in the dire straits, uh, in the perilous fight, which are some of the lines from the song. After considering Bobby Kennedy's talk of a future Negro president, Baldwin scoffed at the notion of needing white people to sanction it. If one must ask permission to be free, it ain't freedom. He also scoffed at the notion of having a Negro president 40 years. He also scoffed at the notion that having a Negro president in 40 years could suddenly fix the country's very fucked up racial history. The irony, of course, is that Bobby Kennedy's prediction was for a moment right. It seemed for a moment that we had come around the big bend on the racial mountain. We got President Barack Obama, but it's unlikely Bobby Kennedy considered the difference between a Negro president and a black president or an African-American president. And I think Barack Obama seemed to have struggled with the distinctions himself. And I'll be like, you know, me too, brother, sometimes. Uh, Baldwin and Hughes are not confused about where black beauty comes from. It comes from black people simply being themselves. And again, you can think about all how this is parallel to the notion of the poet and the notion of that, those lines from the Hughes essay. But how did black people get to be beautiful in the first place is really one question that emerges. What makes black people black people? Several tribes from regions of Africa are captured, shackled, shipped, whipped, propped, killed, submitted to every variety of violence, and what does the violence do to them? Given all that has transpired and continues to transpire against black people's existence, it would not be unreasonable to seek a sort of vengeance, the kind that's imagined by Baraka in that poem. And at one point I was going to play that, but I assume you know it, and you know, you can look it up, the Baraka poem. It's, you know, it's, it's crazy, it's outrageous, but it is dealing with these questions of vengeance and violence. Has any other group of people in the whole history ever been more systematically, more publicly enslaved? Now, I don't even think that's a political statement. That's just true. We are the descendants of constitutional property. We are the descendants of countless people smart enough to have been doctors and poets and presidents who live like and died like farm animals and like equipment for, you know, quite a long time. So that's a lot of, you know, brilliance that's gone. This history makes black people vulnerable. And I think, and this again is underlining my idea about the poem and intimacy and the personal, I also think that this history makes black people powerful. 
and that it makes black people certainly the most African, I mean, the most American motherfuckers ever to live, is what I thought. And I was like, I'm not going to say that because also Native Americans are pretty American, obviously, <laughs> but some of the most American motherfuckers ever live. So, would there be no blackness without slavery becomes a question, which again is a troubling question for especially people who are trying to find their beauty. There might still be African Americans and Negroes, but would there be blackness without slavery? Would there be whiteness without slavery? Baldwin writes, a vast amount of energy that goes into what we call the Negro problem is produced by the white man's profound desire not to be judged by those who are not white, not to be seen as he is, and at the same time, a vast amount of the white anguish is rooted in the white man's equally profound need to be seen as he is. The descendants of enslavers have very much work to do to convince the descendants of the enslaved that they are fully in the land of the free, in the home of the brave. So, Francis Scott Key was not thinking of the enslaved property when he was talking about the land of the free. He could not have truly imagined what freedom might mean in America's future. In fact, he's on record of saying Africans in America were a distinct and inferior race of people. He pushed for the Liberia movement, essentially sending free slaves back to Africa, in quotes, free slaves. None of this makes the creed of the song any less significant. And you can hear me talking about my definitions. If I just start talking without giving you this stuff, you'll be like, what are you talking about? We've heard it enough times to get the gist of it, the land of the free, the home of the brave. It's in every stanza. It's a line of promise. It's a refrain. You hear this enough in grade school and before sporting events, inaugurations, graduations, you might start believing it. You might start expecting, uh, you might start expecting it. You might want to make it come true, this line, land that everybody makes you sing, this the song that everyone makes you sing. So an instrumental version of the Star Spangled Banner, Jimi Hendrix wields his guitar like a flamethrower. He makes it cry and screech like people crying and screeching amid fire jets and sirens. It's a critique of Vietnam, but it's also a celebration of America's almost miraculous wildness. It celebrates destruction and self-destruction, a proper reflection of how the country thrives and how the country ruins. My guess is this is exactly the way Francis Scott Keyes intended it to be played. He just had to wait for the electric guitar to be invented and for Jimi Hendrix to be born. Maybe Key knew America's future would be that of a troubled family, you know, infant tantrum, juvenile delinquency, and a mess of other violent growing pains. That's in Jimi Hendrix's version of the song. Uh, is this feeling in the song because Hendrix hears the American dream, or is it the song because Hendrix is the American dream, which is to say only he could play that? So Baraka's black art separates the people in the room who see it as a poem about violence from the people who see it as a violent poem. The people who see it as a violent poem are more outraged by poems than violence. Art has always been black people's response to violence, to beauty, and to being alive. After the grand jury declined to indict Officer Darren Wilson in the shooting of Michael Brown, a group of Kavi Kahneman poets, y'all probably know what Kavi Kahneman is, organized Black Poets Speak Out, a response. Hundreds of black poets across the US read the following words before they shared their poems. I am a black poet who will not remain silent while this nation murders black people. I have a right to be angry. So I chose Etheridge Knight's poem for Langston Hughes, which I'm gonna read to you in a minute. It expresses the heartbreak that can come before anger. And I think I said something like that. I did not say the line, I have a right to be angry. You know, I just feel like anger is always a cover for something else, is what I'll say to you. Uh, and Baraka's black art, the fantasy of violence, is, an an is animated by a kind of theatrical hysteria, if you check the poem out. Uh, but Knight's poem for Langston Hughes seems at first glance to show the grief that can animate violence. So this is, the, and you know what? I got him reading it. I'm gonna let him read it. Let's let him read it. Let's see here. So I can give you some water. Is this thing still on? Uh, we're almost done here. So this is him reading it, and he'll give you a little setup that we're going to talk about, too.
prison where he been incarcerated for eight years reading that, so that's all that weird noise is going on. But I'll, I'll read it more and more time. Uh, for Langston Hughes, and he didn't actually say it in that. I was like, I have another audio of him reading it where he pretty much says, uh, well, I'll read it, I'll tell you about it later. So here's the poem, for Langston Hughes. Gone, gone, another weaver of black dreams has gone. We sat in June bugs pad with the shades drawn and the air thick with holy smoke, and we heard the lady sing Langston before we knew his name. And when black bodies stopped swinging, Junebug, TJ, and I went out and swung on some cats. Now, I don't think the myth maker meant for us to do that, but we didn't know what else to do. Gone, gone. Another weaver of black dreams has gone. So what strikes me about the poem is not just the depiction of grief, but the confusion between the grief and the violence. We didn't know what else to do, he writes. It reminds me of the violence in Ferguson and Baltimore. Media coverage is always heavy on the stand when riots occur. Martin Luther King, Rodney King, rioting feels like a default response at this point. At such moments, rioting is a strategy, an act of hovering somewhere between anarchy and revolution. The only other option is to do nothing. So violence becomes a form of political action. Destruction, even when it's self-destruction, becomes a viable response to a failed state. Fortunately, art gives us a means to make our angers, our frustrations, our fantasies, and of special interest to me, our confusions, tangible. So Knight's poem could prompt one to ask if it even is a political poem at all. The moment he tells us about the holy smoke, we could rightly say, these dudes aren't, aren't revolutionaries, they're just high. The, the, what moves the poem into the sphere of political poetics involves its blend of confusion and fantasy, if you think again about the kind of fantasy that I suggested was in uh, Baraka's poem, uh, Violent Fantasy. For one thing, Knight was actually still in jail when Hughes died in 1965 from complications related to prostate cancer. So if you're thinking about that, he had already been in jail like four years. So I'm like, who are you going out to smoke? What white boys are you beating up? You know, it's a, it's a fantasy. Um, thus the reaction to his death, and by extension the reaction to the song Strange Fruit, are imagined actions. Furthermore, even if this was actually based on something Knight and his friends did after hearing Strange Fruit, the whole poem remains a fantasy in ways not even the author seems to recognize, because contrary to what Knight says in his introduction to the poem, Langston Hughes did not write Strange Fruit. So call it an example of literal political incorrectness. So I think I cut it out. The deal for me, of thinking about this, is that he, his book comes out in 68, and one of the first things he get to do is go back and do this performance at the prison for all the guys, you know, to show that he's successful, that there's hope. And in setting up that poem, he does say, who do y'all need preachers at him for a long time? Alexis Hughes, and he's saying, he wrote Strange Fruit, I bet y'all don't know that. So when I heard it in 68, I was like, yes, that's a reasonable screw up. But then I heard him do it again in like 1985 at a library in Pennsylvania on video. And I was like, seems like somebody should have told him by then that Lexi Hughes <laughs> did not write Strange Fruit. And that's when I was like, I'm gonna write this out. So Strange Fruit, as we of the information age know, was written by Abel Maripoff, a Jewish high school teacher in the Bronx, after seeing a lynching photograph. Uh, lynching photograph. He later shared a song version with the club owner who subsequently gave it to Billie Holiday. So for me, the question is, could and would Langston Hughes have ever written such a song? Especially if I talk to you about the way he sort of progressed after the Red Scare, after McCarthyism, and he's like, I mean, I gotta leave these politics alone. Um, he lives in the canon as a poet who seems more social than political. As the 60 plus year old Hughes meditates on the role of politics and poetry, we can see one truth, the poet exists within the boundaries of his country and people complicates but does not cancel out that earlier truth that he said when he was 20 years old. I mean, think about that. He wrote the Negro uh, in the Racial Mountain when he was like 24 or something like that. So now he's in his 60s and he's thinking about that. Um, they are in conversation but they don't cancel each other out. Uh, his notion of self-determination. We build our temples for tomorrow, he said in that first essay, strong as we know how, and we stand on the top of a mountain free within ourselves. One venturing into the space between art for others and art for the self must be simultaneously simultaneous, contradictory, vulnerable, and slanted. So if you're not looking at things the way I'm saying, you know, I'm looking at them, the Star Spangled Banner really has nothing to do with black people. Black people have their own national anthem. And just the whole ironic nature of documents like the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights and the Constitution for black folks make us want very separate things. And it makes a brother even want to take a knee during the national anthem um, because of its hypocrisy. So I read the gestures of someone like Colin Kaepernick as a totally patriotic display of the brother's disappointment, even outrage in the state of things. So again, if it's true, like, of course you're going to be upset. Why are you asking me to stand at this thing that you don't really believe in? 
I don't know how Baldwin felt about the black national anthem, but I know he liked good music, so I'm going to assume he didn't like it. <laughs> Sonny's Blues by young James Baldwin, published in 1957, is about a jazz man who transformed. We were talking, I was, I put this in there, we were talking about it yesterday. Uh, when you hear his brother. So Sonny's Blues is very much about music. And I think y'all know some of the great lines. All I know about music is that not many people ever really hear it. And then when on a rare occasion, when something opens within, the music enters and what we mainly hear or hear corroborated are personal, private, vanishing evocations. But the man who creates the music is hearing something else, is dealing with the roar rising from the void and imposing order on it as it hits the air. So I'm reading that for one reason to say like, yeah, definitely, um, he knows how to write about music, but also to say highly lyrical in 57, just thinking about the quietness of Sonny's Blues versus like what we come to think of as James Baldwin. So it's an intimate and lyrical essay, and then almost a decade later, Baldwin published a very controversial short story called Going to Meet the Man about a, wit a bigoted white sheriff. Uh, and then here's a quote from that. He tried to be a good person and treat everyone right. It wasn't his fault the niggers had taken it into their heads to fight against God and to go against the rules laid down in the Bible for everyone to read. He was doing his duty, protecting white people from niggers and the niggers from themselves. America lives between those two stories, the story of a private lyric and the story of a public outcry. I also think this is true of Let's Get It On as well as What's Going On. America lives between those two songs. So Marvin Gaye is another who further eliminates, uh, further illuminates the means of our national anthem. He sang the Star Spangled Banner at the NBA All-Star Game in 1983. After singing the Star Spangled Banner, Marvin Gaye told an interviewer that sometimes you have to leave the country to love it. He'd been having a hard time here, divorce, taxes, depression, and not long after here, my dear, he found himself in self-exile in a small Belgian beach town in the off season. He was trying to kick his drug habit. So I visited this place, Austin, Belgium, twice. And I'm not saying I'm the reason, but the first time I walked all over town asking about him because there wasn't anything there. There was like no tour or anything. But when I went back a few years later, they had a tour. So I think it's because I was, it still was a terrible tour, actually, but they were trying. Uh, but it just takes you a bunch of unimpressive, uh, yeah, yeah, the tour takes you to a bunch of unimpressive addresses. He could do nothing but get clean there. He sanctified himself. And in a DVD I brought while I was there, I brought actually in Belgium. They weren't even selling DVDs there. I brought it in Brussels. He jogs, flirts plays music, basketball, and after a long while singing to himself and God and occasionally at the local casino, he returned to America. He wrote Sexual Healing while he was over there. He was a man trying to be more free and more brave, and one hears all this in his Star Spangled Banner in 1983. He sings it, not, he sings it like a song, not an anthem, or it's just some other kind of very intimate anthem. Something happened to him while he was exiled, trying to rediscover or restore or revise himself, his voice isn't the same in any other song, really. I have other versions of him singing that, and it's not quite the song, same. And then, of course, he was dead a year later, uh, shot by his father. So no, Hughes didn't write Strange Fruit, but he did write a poem called The Backlash Blues. His friend Nina Simone made it into a song the same year of his death. Perhaps this is the Hughes poem, Night Confused with Strange Fruit. After all, he was in prison, you know, maybe he got the wrong information. So also around the time of his death, uh, Langston Hughes wrote The Panther and the Lash, and one, this is where the Backlash Blues poem was. So one reviewer of The Panther and the Lash criticized Hughes for failing to take a side politically in the book. We are tempted to ask, this critic said, what are Hughes' politics, and if he has none, why not? So the age demands intellectual commitment from its spokesman. It's hard to read or hear the Backlash Blues and still question Hughes' intellectual commitment to politics, he was unwavering in his commitment to black culture, but that did not make him immune to political doubt. Isn't doubt often a byproduct of intellectual commitment? Hughes enacts Fisher Ames' extended definition of politics. So I started with that. Yes, politics is the science of good sense applied to public affairs, but are those ever changing? What is wisdom today would be folly and perhaps ruin tomorrow. Politics cannot live by fixed principles which, from which a wise man would never swerve. I think I read that correctly. That's the extra part. It's a little bit more complicated from just saying it's the science of good sense. Uh, he says they're also ever-changing, and any wise man would not be fixed in his political stance. So it is in Hughes's swerves and slants that a particular, peculiar, unpredictable political aesthetic emerges. The Langston Hughes, uh, who could have written Strange Fruit, was always there wrestling with the Langston Hughes, who could not have written it. Etheridge's poem, for Langston Hughes, unwittingly or not, pays homage to the beautiful and 
human mix of conviction and confusion and belief and bewilderment and vengeance and vulnerability. What will happen to all your beauty? The dudes in that poem are confronted with that question, even as a fantasy. And so that's really the question mark for all of us here. Uh, some poetics are in the stuff that I said about you. Some politics are in the stuff I said about Baldwin. <laughs> and that's really it. Uh, so I guess I, I'm going to play you like when I'm saying the Willie Nelson thing. What I was really thinking about was Robert Wyatt, who used to be with uh, Soft Machine. He has, I don't even know where I got this thing from, but he has a version of Strange Fruit that he performs. So I'll play that, and then, you know, maybe I'll play uh, Backlash Blues so that you can hear again, just Nina Simone a little bit, and then we can talk. So when I think about, like, can, can the anthem be revised, I think, and I think you hear what I'm saying. Maybe you don't. You can ask me questions if you don't. If you hear why this would be of interest to me based on what's going on in the essay, and really based on what Baldwin's talking about, too. Um, but this is like the proof in the pudding, as I said, you know, the thing, of the, you know, the blood of the thing is really where we wind up, as I talk theoretically, so I had to let you hear something. Anyway, here's Strange Fruit. Let me know what I need to fix. All right. Uh, well, I'm gonna. I'm gonna start. I, you know, 
put on ask a question and I really did get excited because my question is so useless that they'll be like, I gotta, I gotta fix this. Um, because, um, I wrote, the, I wrote a question. Okay. But I wrote it before I heard anything you had to say. Uh -huh. And so I was like, how am I gonna, how am I gonna do this? That's all right. Um, but no, I think no it's, it's, it's semi-appropriate. Because, so at the reading last night, mm -hmm. you read, uh, you know, you read all the new poems, and the new poems are all called, and we heard one today, um, American Sonic from a Past and Future. Mm -hmm. My understanding, at least, is that you started writing these right after the election. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I'm thinking about them a lot uh, for, for a little while now. Um, and in, in a lot of ways, they're very different from his poems, but in other ways, they kind of remind me of um, sonnets Robert Lowell wrote for Notebook in no, History and those books, okay. you know, where he was right. doing sort of day books of sonnets. Sure, sure. I was sure you were going to say Berryman's sonnet. Yeah, no, no, well, because Berryman is, you know, he's... That works, that works. You know, those are like love affair sonnets. Whereas Lowell's sonnets are dealing with, like, history and they're dealing with, like, this great political turmoil yeah, yeah. that he was, you know, I mean, you know, uh, Notebook comes out in, I think, 69? And so he's writing them in 67, 68. Right, yeah. yeah, and so... Um, I guess my question is, what is it about this form that, you know, you can answer it in a couple different ways, mm -hmm. either attracts particular poets um, in moments of political turmoil, or was it about the form that drew you to it right. in this moment? Uh, I think I probably had something in this talk at one point about metaphor. I really don't know how to... So, but to me, though, it is like, there is this game, there is this form that everybody knows about. It's called maybe basketball, but it also could be called Reagan Science. And so at some point, you do want to know how you do in the field of action. And so the kind of debate is about like how, how much are you going to follow the rules. So like when people started Duncan initially, like even Lou Alcindor, which is what his name was, they outlawed Duncan. But it's like, but that's sort of the evolution of the game, and it's not really breaking the rules. It's just bending them a little bit, getting that close. So that is my relationship to the sonnet. I know that there is a tradition. Hence me putting like America on the front of it because I'm like, well, there's an English sonnet, there's an Italian sonnet, there's even kind of a Milton sonnet. I think there's a Hayden sonnet, a couple of models of Hayden sonnets. And this is just again, as I sort of said in the talk, that's me deciding this after teaching it and saying, well, what is an American sonnet? And then thinking about Wanda's and her sort of weird, interesting definitions of the form and trying to teach it that way. And then Wanda Coleman, and then sort of saying, yeah, I think I want to meditate really on what that is. And I would say, uh, if there's 70 poems in the book, there are 70 definitions of what that might be. And I think that's probably right to how the country functions. Like, will we ever really settle on a definition of an American sign? Like, Americans? Somebody else might. Like, Martians later, when they're reading about America, they're like, this seems like the most consistent definition of an American sign. But, but what I would say otherwise, and I, you know, I've said this to, like, really super formal people who thought I was a formalist until I you know, did this kind of thing. It's like, well, you know, you're not, it doesn't scan, you're not doing all the rules. And I would say, but if I was doing it, it wouldn't have been American sign. It would be like, you know, something else. It would be maybe an Italian sign. So the whole notion that I would be fully engaged in the forum, it sort of undermines what I think I'm trying to explore, which is like, well, what is this box that we are in? And what do we look like inside this box? And by we, I do mean, as I implied, and I do think like, you know, the clearest understanding of what America is, is certainly rooted in the relationship between black people and white people here. And black people trying to make it the land of the free, you know, home of the brave. Without that, like, can we really talk about having that been battle-tested? I don't count the American Revolution as really battle-tested, you know what I mean? So, anyway, so that goes into this notion of, like, well, what is this thing that we're in, and can we get out of it? How do we move around inside of it? Which is why, as I think I said, I'm interested in the votes of, like, how you make terms in this box that they got you in, so, how you pace the cell. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I like that. Uh, one other question I wanted to ask, and it's mm -hmm. it's, it's it's not even like half cut because I've just been thinking about it. But so part of the work that a lot of the political poet poems, like the sixties, are doing, particularly like the Barack poem that you were quoting, mm -hmm. is part of how it does its political work is it engages um, on the level of diction in a way where the reader is going to see it and be kind of shocked. Like, sure, yeah, he's like, yeah, what are you doing? And that's what's going to listen to. Yeah, yeah, and right. that's part of how he gets a hold of the mind. Right. You know, right. the, the shock grabs onto the reader. So what sort of, like, moves on the level of diction or music can a poem make 
I mean, this is a pretty broad question, actually. Can a poem make nowadays? Uh, because you can't really shock in that way. You can't. Right. You can shock yourself, maybe, though. You can shock yourself. Which would be your first concern, I would think, beyond yeah. some notion of audience or yeah. uh, purpose. It seems like that's a pretty good place to start. And so it makes it hard for me like, to critique people who are reveling in cliche because I'm like, well, I'm surprised you didn't know that was a cliche, but you know, it sounds good to you. I'm not going to buy the book, but you know, <laughs> if that works for you, I'll take that. Like, I'm glad you got a little pleasure out of that. So I would say generally, I don't really uh, think of moves quite in that way. Um, but I think of surprise, I guess, in that way. I don't know if that answers it. I don't think of it as a kind of like, a thing you kind of know going in. Can, can, right, you, like, yeah, can yeah, you plan no, to surprise no. yourself? I mean, I guess you can, but it seems like the whole point of surprise is to not really know, you know, where you're going to wind up, I guess. Does that answer that question? No, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that makes sense. I mean, surprise, I think people does it. Uh, so, questions from y'all? You got some. We're good. It must have been perfect. Nobody has any questions. <laughs> I'm <not> super clear. <laughs> <laughs> questions from anybody? Smart graduate students who are here in my classes, for example. <laughs> whom I see. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you had one thank you for the talk. It was lucid and powerful. We should talk a bit about James Walden Johnson. I'm surprised you had your beef with that. No, no, no. I said the it's poem is fine. It's the singing. It's the singing. Yeah, 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 yeah. His brother put it to music. But I said it's like, I'm fine. It's not really a poem. It's not. That it's, or even though the lyrics are in there, but it's sort of like the way that it's, uh, the intonation is on it, you know, yeah, yeah. but it is the singing of it that I really, right. which is why I would like it if Willie Nelson did it, I think that would be dope. <laughs> okay. it's, okay. Kind of like, yeah. it's interesting, because I grew up singing it, because I went to an all-black private school uh -huh. here in Harlem, started by James Walton Johnson's yes. right. and was singing it every morning. Uh -huh. so I, I, I mean, her brother is the one who put it to music. Music, music. right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, her dad. Her dad, dad. Yeah, 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 exactly, so thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Nice so I what do you think, though? Am I, am I wrong that it's kind of like, you ain't never really heard that song with no soul in it, though? I mean, when a hundred little black kids sing it, it sounds great. Really? Like growing us. I want to be converted. I mean, I have to yeah. look it up. And yeah, boys okay. Fire in Harlem, see them singing or something like that. I think that would be great, because yeah. I think it's, it's the doing of the thing, right? right. And part of it was just what it meant to us. Right. I think, so. I, I'm not going to say who this person is, because she lives in the neighborhood. But I did it with a respectable, <laughs> like, you know, inaugural poet. And uh, I was we were having a conversation about it. We were having a conversation about it, the whole thing. And I was like, well, that's like that's all for Negroes, like black people around. We gotta, you know, we gotta do something with that because it is a it's a Negro song. And so she's like, oh, you're being too hard on it. And I was like, you would say that though because you're respectable. <laughs> we're still friends though. We're still friends. But so I know I understand like what the respectability around that is, and we ain't got that much. But I'm just asking for like a little more rhythm in the song. Ah, I'm just asking yeah. for like a better rendition. Yes. Yeah. It's also about like every voice to say. But um, I wonder, like, if it's so, like Don Jay, if it's like not sure. a banger, like, right. should we change it? Like, should we so, change it? So, that's what I mean. That's, like, that's the implication in the, in the uh, Willie Nelson, and that's the implication in having like Robert Wyatt sing Strange Fruit. It's really about like the kind of narrow view of what it means to be American, how that relates. So I'm doing the opposite by saying about Star Spangled Banner. Like the really re the reason Star Spangled Banner works is because of who's singing it. So you see what I'm saying? Like it's because Marvin Marvin Gaye and Jimi Hendrix renew it. The song by itself is not so particularly interesting, but the spectacle of them seeing it is really what renews it. So I'm just saying, thinking about like what does it really mean and who does it mean it for should be opened up. Like it is a song that has a lot more interest in it when it's not narrow to this sort of and that actually goes back to everything that Baldwin and I think uh what when I'm sort of implying when I talk about the the racial mountain essay like it seemingly is only for black poets who are thinking about race but it's really not if you look at it it's as interesting as like uh the poetics of confessionalism like it's essentially saying his essay Hughes's essay is that like black this should be at the nexus of a black poetics I mean that's what that's calling for but that's not that different than saying like life should be Confessionalism, life should be at the nexus of one's poetics. So I'm just sort of suggesting there's a more interesting way to think about what this means, what blackness means. And the problem with the song is that it's an example of like it being sort of too confined to like straight jacket until even like a definition of Negro versus a definition of African American or black. Yeah. Um, so what do you think you found uh, exploring the song, the American song? What, do you, what did you find? Within yourself. Yeah, I mean, what I, I think I sort of alluded to that in the beginning because my first thing would be like I'm always most interested in like you know questions and generally punctuation, but certainly 
the implication of trying to ask what is an American sonnet. So I would say what I'm saying, like the thing I've been working on is just trying to like be whatever I think of as personal. And I suggested like the, I want that Frank O'Hara essay on personal to be clearer, but you know, he wrote it like at lunch or something before he went somewhere. But inside of it, there are some interesting ideas. And it is this notion of like, when he's talking about it, it's like having a person in the conversation, I think he said something about wearing pants. And so inside of it to me is a conversation about immediacy and, uh, and intimacy. So that's sort of what I'm trying to like knock around inside of the form. But it's just questions. I can't say beyond being personal, which means like all of my concerns about the political moment are folded into that. So I, they're not they're generally in the order that I wrote them, but I did start out much more explicit and uh, angry, really. And some of those poems are still there. Like I got a poem thinking about like Trinidad James and Gucci Man and and Donald Trump, you know, obviously is a pimp. Like it's the same, like all gold, everything, clearly that's Donald Trump. You know, so there are other poems early on where I'm really just thinking about the way he's a pimp. But that just got old after a couple of poems. So if you're saying, what did you get out of it? Like I knew that that wasn't going to be enough. It wasn't going to be enough to have a series of interesting or surprising poems for me thinking about who he was. And so the arc of it becomes, you know, like yeah, yeah notions of black hy hysteria growing out of like, is this not driving you crazy? But working on that inside that form just leads it to some some other places, I think. But yeah, I'm, does that answer? I don't know if you yeah, answer. That's, that's that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You were, you didn't finish yours. Do you want to? Oh, was there more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. Okay. no, it was a quick lead in to right. ask you about victory. Oh, okay, right. cool. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. Part of what you're getting at. Because you asked this question later right. about what happens to the soul of this victory won by vengeance. Yes, yes. And part of what I'm wondering is how can we think maybe other visions of victory, like from sure. our traditions, or even Asash yeah. Shakur saying it's our duty to win, we have nothing to lose but our chains. Right. I wonder then what is that? vision of victory and what right. is its relationship to violence right. and when do you think actually moving on from a black arts movement what do we lose in terms mm -hmm. of our poetics and our, our relationship to violence yeah and but come to and that's very parallel to i guess what have we lost from from integration like the notion yeah. and again you hear all of this stuff that sort of i'm just sort of walking by with y'all but that it's implicit in the two-state nation and of course like you know malcolm's assassination is what that's the same year actually barack wrote black art that is the initi initiation for the black arts movement and even as like the, you know, it doesn't become a, a religious movement because as I said, with this assassination at the beginning, I think of the end of whatever their respectability was, whatever their ties to his assassination. Leaving the group and the, was it fruits of, yeah. So I'm saying like, there's a way that like, that movement is still connected to like a different kind of, you know, social reality. So it has been, if you do the time, I think that was 40 years from, his notion to ours, and I think we're trying to shape now what that new sort of poetics looks like. And I do think it is complicated by integration. It makes it harder to think about us versus them and this notion of the two-state nation. Going back to it doesn't seem right to me. Uh, and I mean, I always say, like, I don't have answers. I think that the, the best ways I can answer that kind of question are in the thinking around the essay. And I am trying to do two things. I'm trying to say, like, obviously, uh, Black is beautiful, that notion is very useful, but for me personally, I'm interested in like, once we've established that, because I'm not a person, as I don't, I don't know if Baldwin is this person either. I don't really struggle with that, so I don't find myself having to like, convince people. I mean, I think that's in my poems. I'm not really writing poems that convince people that blackness is beautiful, or that, you know, if I think that, it's their manifest in what the poem is doing, but if that's my sole mission, again, that's gonna be too narrow for what the poem is trying to explore. But I am writing towards that, and I am thinking about, like, what are the options now? Like, where do we go after that, after we come through that sort of notion? And, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I have some ideas, and I think whatever you think I was saying between the lines are probably, whatever I was saying between the lines are probably more clear than what I could say now explicitly to you about next movements. But I think that that's sort of what the essay is thinking about, like this idea of really, it's not really about them. It really is about, like, your own responsibility to want your own beauty. So you can find a large people, a lot, a lot of people uh, across the artistic spectrum still kind of stuck in proving to people that black is beautiful. And I would just say like, you know, that's not really a question for me. There are other questions about like, what do I do with my beauty? What do I do with my blackness? And that's not, has nothing to do with white people. You know what I mean? So that's really what I'm thinking about in a critique of, of what it means. And then also trying to reclaim this notion of like, that's not a, that's not a two state answer to say that I'm not concerned about how white people see me is not saying I want to be separate from them. I'm saying, well, America is America. Like, we are all dealing really with the same kinds of questions of uh, Americanness. And so as opposed to sort of separating that out as a different kind of project, like, if anything, that is at the core of the project. Like, 
a person of color, an African American person, thinking about like what is the true creed of the country and how does that relate to like you know I don't even think that's sort of radical stuff to say there, but again questions as I said the title has a question in it and it is the stuff that it does run parallel to what I'm working on now is what I would say I think that as I said intimacy bewilderment confusion like how do you make this vulnerability is a big one how do you make that part of your political stance how do you incorporate that into your sense of like morality rightness change and that's really what I'm working out like is that possible I might find out in 10 years it's not but that's sort of some of the stuff that comes through again in the poems like how do you allow yourself to be open to these other kinds of questions while uh, challenging sort of the status quo yeah yes um, I have a question on identity politics mm -hmm. uh, I think Baldwin has an essay in the book called Unwritten Rules that talks about for me and how I'm thinking about it is more kind of like a retrospective question than like what comes next. I don't know if that's what you're asking. But I would say, for me, I am suggesting like, oh, okay, blackness does come out of slavery. Like, is there blackness without slavery? And as I said, there's one way in our kind of traditional black is beautiful thinking that that's not a, you don't want to sit with that very long. But I think that's pretty amazing, as I said, to have come through that and to have made art in response to it, to have become artists and become what black people sort of represent, certainly for the country, but for the world too. Like, would that be true without slavery? So I am connecting blackness to a kind of like uh, ingenuity in some ways. So to me, that's a retrospective thought because it is like, well, where does we know where Negro comes from? We know even in some ways where color comes from. But like, what is this notion of blackness? And I think that is a very American notion. And so I'm saying, well, when I go back to it, that seems to be to have a large role in our understanding of it. But I think that's a positive thing. I think that's a powerful thing as opposed to like being descendants of slaves as a kind of negative thing. I have one of the, uh, actually this is in the uh, Trinidad James one, I think, which is like, um, we relate the way the descendants of the raped relate to the descendants of their rapists or something like that. Like if that is our history, if one descendant is the enslaver and one descendant is the slave, like that's gonna be a hard relationship. That's not an impossible relationship, but you might ask who does that fall to really? Who has to forgive whom? And that gets back to this notion of victory. like. What does it mean to like set that right? And I just think that that's a, for me, uh, and this is you know it's a generational thing. I just don't think that a pure black arts movement aesthetic purely, purely corrects that. Even though you heard me at the end turn into like that, I'm not I'm not dogging a black arts poem. I think it's a very interesting poem. But as I said, people who see that poem as just a violent poem versus people who see it as a poem about violence, I just think that does say something about like the way things are separated. Like really, are we really more upset about like? people making art to come to combat this stuff than we are with the fact that it happens. And so that ultimately means that the poem, I'm on the side of the poem, even though I think it's just a slither of how we contend with these things. And finally I will say that the many I find this part of the questions, but I will also say that it still connects to like the notion of Barack Obama because I find the reason and I, I said I've walked by this too. Like I think that part of what Baldwin was saying, and it's very visible and he's on record saying it in the essay, but it's funny I think in the documentary where he's essentially saying both, why do you think we need your permission to have a black president? But I think a deeper thing that he's suggesting is also like, why do you think that's gonna fix anything? Like, is that our big prize? And of course we know. Well, you might've said before it happened, it might be, it might be, it might be. I think everybody thought it might be like, what is the top of the racial mound that Hughes is talking about and MLK are talking about? But I would suggest that Baldwin was like, it's gonna take a little more than that. And I think we're finding that he was totally right. And so for a minute, it seemed like I think that he was wrong. I think actually he's right about what's the big deal with that? What is that really going to do for this long, complicated, messy, nuanced, weird history that white people and black people have in the country? Would that really be? So it's a similar thing. I mean, I'm riffing now on like reparations. Like, is that really going to fix it? I mean, you might feel a little good for a little while, but you know, the money's going to be gone and you're still going to be the descendants 
of a slave. So it seems like, again, I don't have answers, but I'm suggesting that, like, for me in that era, this is why I was doing thinking about moving the decades with even cues, that era is the beginning of thinking about it, but it's sort of like we haven't really, it becomes a benchmark. Maybe this is because of Malcolm X or MLK, uh, and this, is, I think, is some disappointment even with the end of Barack Obama's reign, like, understand, like, well, wasn't he supposed to, like, be this agent for change? And I'm thinking, but again, I feel like that's a lot of pressure, and I think it's a different kind of a world. That's almost like an MLK model for what he's supposed to impact. And I would say, can we really expect that in 2017 to be? And as I said, again, I walked by it, but I, I said it very deliberately. I think Barack Obama also struggled with this. What does it mean to be Negro in America, African American in America, Black in America, all of those things. And so I'm acknowledging that I think that's part of people's frustration is that he too was struggling with it. But of course he was. I mean, it's a huge thing to contend with every day, like what, how do you relate, and how are you seen, and what label do you prefer, all these kinds of questions that everybody contends with, I think. Yeah, yeah I think, yeah. yeah. Do, you, oh, do you, kind of relating to this idea of Barack Obama as president, do you think Barack Obama is part of this kind of struggle with the idea of a black president fixing things or solving things about his approval is because he didn't get to be president based on his blackness or that identity, but he rose to president by, in some ways, taking part in a societal and governmental system that was built by and for white people. And so it wasn't, it was about him, but at the same time it was about him inside of a white power structure. Yeah, but I mean, that's what politics are. I mean, it's more about structure, kind of continuing with that story. I think you're right. He made a decision to sort of enter into it. And you know, the kind of flippant response is often like, it is politics, so that's sort of what he continued with. But I would just say, again, I don't even know if that's like a quick answer on that. I mean, I think, again, uh, the state of things tells us how complicated all that is. And all I can say about that is I, we sometimes don't think that it might be or was, presently is an issue for him as well. Like, we all are contending with what this is and how should I be in this space. And for me, that's what I witnessed. And so I had always had sympathy for him because I felt like I'm struggling between these identities. I think he probably was doing that long before he ever became president. And some could certainly see that as, a, this was an, alluded to in the Hughes thing, some would see that as a problem, like, are you choosing sides? Like, what are you going to be? As opposed to being like a president and trying to lead. And again, I mean, it's all in there. I, I, you know, this probably be three times as long. You can see the problems with the president who leads only by you know, equates politics with advocating for identity, value, belief system, because I think that's what, you know, the air quotes dude is doing. I mean, I think he is leading by what he thinks is a, a belief system that's satisfactory for America, and it's like, that's not. So I wouldn't say, if I think I hear that in the question, I don't think that would naturally be the way that Barack Obama would have gone, or if it would have really affected, you know, how his perception of these struggles, is what I would say. You know, not to get in the dude's head, but does that answer the question? So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, what I'll say to you, I started out this way, is that, I mean, I do think all of my answers for answers, I just go to poems. So, if you ask me to come in and talk and talk about politics, it's going to be rooted in sort of the questions that lead me to poetry, as opposed to, uh, I mean, like, if I could really do a speech, I'd probably be a politician or something, you know what I mean? Like, so much of what I think about always goes back to poems, and I hope that was underneath everything that I was saying, like the notion of invitation, the notion of intimacy, compassion, um, all of that, I think, is in there as we're talking about politics. They are, and I think, again, the poems are, that's why I did it, are trying to enact some of these questions. Uh, that's what I go to. That's what I'm trying to work out, I guess, now. Yes? How are we doing with time? I think, I think that, that that might be it. Oh, OK. Cool. Sorry. Yeah. I'll stand around if you want to come ask me. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks, guys.